This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we support design engineers and make lightning protection easy. You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, Alan. So another week, another episode. How is everything out there in uh, Massachusetts? Well, Dan, you know, it's weird. We we're seem to be coming out of the coronavirus thing just fine, but now we're in a drought. And I know last week we we're talking about uh, was it locusts or cicada? What's the crazy yeah, bugs that we cicadas, have? Cicadas. Yep. Yeah. So we've gone to from corona to drought <laughs> to insect infestations. So it's crazy right now, uh, and it's still mid June. You know, it's it's supposed to be. It is nice outside. It'll start but, raining uh, snakes probably any day. It'll start raining cobras. <laughs> Cats and dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Any kind of small animal? Oh no, we snakes, know we did it. snakes will come out of the toilets. That's what'll that's what it'll be. <laughs> so in today's episode, uh in our first segment, in our in our news segment, uh we've got uh about Spirit. You know, they're one of the big uh part suppliers for Boeing. So some news there. The last A three eighty, uh, you know, end of an era is uh is on our list here. We're gonna talk about some of the new developments in uh cabins and specifically seats obviously this is big time re-coronavirus uh we're also going to talk a little bit about uh united airlines flight 811 which this is kind of in our learn from failure segment which uh obviously aviation has evolved a lot over the years and we're going to talk about just how cargo doors have changed uh in part because of that incident which is really really fascinating i mean tragic but a really interesting story and, and the investigation took some twists and turns and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Airbus's new drone copter and this potential flying car model uh, that's uh, after the Israeli Cormorant, um, which is, I guess, not, uh, it, it's like a prototype vehicle, but it's actually flown, just hasn't had any uh, right. passengers in it yet. So, um, right. so Alan, what's, uh, what's the deal with Spirit? Spirit is a big supplier to Boeing, has been that way for a long time. They also supply parts to Airbus and I think they used to do Gulfstream too, but they're a big 737, 787 supplier to, to Boeing. And with the 737 MAX essentially on hold until we get to flight testing, what looks like flight testing with the FAA is coming up at the end of this month, but the they just had to put it on hold. Uh, yeah. they, they have so many airplanes on the ground already. What are they going to do? You can't keep putting more airplanes on the ground. So Boeing finally issued the stop work to Spirit. Now, but I, the things I've been reading about it are that the the stop work is only for about two to three weeks. At least that's the initial cut on it is in a couple of weeks, everybody's going to be brought back. They think the flight test will be done and then we're quasi back to normal again, which yeah. is good. So it's, it's not permanent layoffs, but it's still not any fun because Wichita is just getting hammered right now because Textron, Cessna, Beach have, have been shut down for a while. Uh, and since Boeing is essentially pulled out of Wichita, it's been pretty rough there. And Bombardier uh, selling off all their business, everything but the business airplanes, it's been pretty tough times in Wichita. Yeah, so it looks like, it, like you said, 21-day layoff uh, was announced uh, Wednesday. And so Spirit, which makes the 737 fuselage, is going to furlough or lay off temporarily about 900 workers. So. Yeah, I mean, you don't think, I, I, I think a lot of people out there don't think about the trickle down with, you know, how Huge many of these down. incredibly yeah. complex machines are parted out and subcontracted to so many other smaller companies that are, yeah. you know, essentially like those little, those little fish that, you know, follow the big whale, right? And they, they're just yeah. along for the ride the whole time. So a lot um, of all the sub suppliers get shut down when that happens. Uh, Wichita is a, a town of, 250,000, 300,000 people. So you wouldn't think 900 employees would make that big of a difference, but it really does have a significant impact on the community because those 900 people are not going out to dinner, they're not shopping. Everything kind of stops for them for a couple of weeks because they're going to try to conserve and do everything they can until they, the job starts again. So it's a bigger impact on the community than just the 900 it affects a lot of families and it directly affects the economy in Wichita every yeah. time this happens. Yeah. You it's just tough. never hopefully, get used to it. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we're through this, uh, this sooner than later, but mm. 
you know, who knows? Like we said, it could be could be raining snakes before we you know we have to we have to yeah. halt all of our traffic because there's too many snakes in the, in the skies. And, and we need to talk a little bit about the uh, the seven thirty seven. So they're trying to get that re certified but some of them are still right. in operation is that right so explain that to me well not that not the maxes the maxes aren't right so yeah. anything that had the the uh new flight control system that that was acting up and they had to recertify all those airplanes were immediately grounded right so they got grounded overseas and they got then the the president grounded him in the states those airplanes are not flying it's all the older airplanes the 737 700s 800s are flying not the dash 8 or dash 9 which were the maxes uh so at some point, though, uh, that's what Boeing was making was the Maxes, and that's what's sitting on. Uh, there's, I think there's 400 plus airplanes on tarmacs right now of new airplanes that they got to deliver pretty soon. It's gonna have to happen sooner rather than later. They can't sit on those airplanes forever. Uh, but there's a there's a bunch of going back and forth this week uh, between the European regulators. Boeing and the FAA, because the FAA wants to get to a test flight, so does Boeing, because that's sort of the last little checkbox before they can get back to delivering aircraft. And uh, it sounded like the EASA and the Europeans wanted some additional features to be put on the airplane, like synthetic airspeed, which is a new thing for yeah. Boeing. And Boeing mm-hmm. declined to do, at least declined to do that up front and said they would do it. It's sort of a software thing uh, that they can add onto the airplane. So, so that's going to happen. Can you explain real quick what synthetic airspeed is? Uh, so it's not actually a true measurement of airspeed. They're using at least the description. I in the Airbus airplanes already have this, and so uh, I think Yasu was just familiar with it. It sounds like it's a combination of some air data, but also coupled with GPS uh, position and GPS airspeed. So it it's sort of another check on airspeed. Think of it that way. It's an, it's like an electronic check on airspeed that actually isn't directly measuring airspeed. You can kind of you can kind of cheat airspeed there's when you get at altitude there's things about air densities that play into airspeed um but in this particular case we're just trying to give you another another bit of information to compare against it's not a bad idea i just think boeing decided not to do it early on it didn't have the means to incorporate it and they couldn't do it on a, on a very quick turn notice so boeing sort of balked and the fa said they didn't really need it but it sounds like boeing's going to agree to do it which is fine. You know, I think everybody's got to come together and figure out what the right direction forward is. It's just uh, when you get as many certification organizations overlooking a particular design, you're going to have differing opinions and differing outcomes because that's what they're familiar with. Like if, if we were down in Brazil looking at the way that they've designed Embraer airplanes, the authorities in Brazil would want it done differently because that's what they're used to. Same thing with the ASA, same thing all over the world. It's not any different. Russia's different than the United States. Oh, that's fine. But if you're Boeing and you're delivering airplanes to all those different places, you got to satisfy all those groups. And that can get a little overwhelming. Gotcha. So uh, the Airbus A380 looks like they're delivering their final plane. Yeah. So yep. why is that the end of an era? Why was the A380 uh, important or interesting? Well, it was a, really the biggest passenger airplane. It's just truly a double decker, unlike the 747, which had a limited upper deck. The A380 could haul over 800 people at any time. The, and, you know, it's one of those crazy things you read about that the in the United States press, you read, you read it right up this way. Uh, Boeing tricked Airbus into building the A380. Boeing feigned like they were going to make this double-decker big airplane, basically take the 747 and put the double-decker all the way down the whole length of the airplane. Airbus didn't have anything to compete with it. Boeing played it up enough and introduced it and said they're going to make it so that Airbus had to go respond to it. Then Airbus came out with the A380 and Boeing said, well, we're not going to do it. And this left Airbus to hang out to dry. That's what the press in the United States would say. I I don't know. So that's necessarily true. I think Airbus is smarter than that and probably thought about that outcome. But I think they had a market for the airplane. It's a four engine airplane. Four engine airplanes are expensive on fuel. Uh, and and it had limited places where it could fly because of the weight and also because you had two decks you had to unload. So that made it um, difficult. And that there's only certain places in the United States which can accommodate it. And that was one of the first hurdles. And the second hurdle is it just never really had great sales. I don't think any of the U.S. big, bigger U.S. airlines ever incorporated one after all these years. And so that doesn't really help an, air, uh, an airplane. You got to have a Delta 
or United or American in the U.S. to help keep the the, the, the factory line running, and they just never got to that point. So gotcha, just not enough yes. wide, widespread adoption. No, yeah, it, it's not. It's kind of like the I want to say it's like the Con- Concorde, but it's kind of like the Concorde. You never had a U.S. operator of it. You had British Airways, you have Air France, and that was it. And you kind of run out of possibilities of delivering an airplane at some point, yeah. and they have enough, and then you're done. Then you're done. That's where the A380 is. But the A380 still is an engineering marvel. There's no doubt about that. And and Airbus had done a tremendous job of even creating that airplane, the miles and miles and miles of wire. It's like a flying city, right? It's just enormous. And to even think that that was possible is remarkable. So Airbus had done a good job with the airplane. It's just it's really a market and timing will kill all airplanes eventually. Yeah, that makes sense. And then lastly, the, uh, the Gulfstream is discontinuing the yeah G550. that's a big one that's been around a long time i think that came out in early 2000s and as the g5 and then it went to the 550 uh, as performance enhancements happened but Gulfstream always is evolving into the next airplane the g600 or 650 right and then there's talk of a g7 so there's always the next airplane you're always trying to make the airplane one more efficient more fuel efficient for sure and hopefully faster at the same time, and uh, more lux- in their case, I, I think more luxurious, right? The early Gulf Streams, the Gulf Streams threes, were nice airplanes, but <laughs> it's not a G five, okay, and it's not a, uh, a, a six. So, uh, in terms of Gulf Stream putting putting that airplane to bed, it probably makes sense because they want to move on to the next airplane and, and the next engine and the next performance increase. It just, that all makes sense. All it's like auto, it's like cars, right? Every year there's a new model car. On airplanes, it doesn't really happen like that. On airplanes, they they run it as long as there's a marketplace for it, and then they upgrade it when the market gets soft. All right, so we're going to start our uh, our sort of engineering segment on the show here, and we're going to talk about seats and cabin d- dividers. So, obviously, with COVID nineteen. Planes. I mean, every business, you know, where you see it everywhere, there's dividers and grocery stores, there's all sorts of wacky things in, uh, in, in restaurants, you know, the world's changing just to give you a more personal space, essentially, you know, like what's been happening in bathrooms forever, you know, dividers, you know, all that sort of stuff. (laughs) It's coming to kitchens. It's coming to, you know, just everywhere. So there's a couple different variations here that are happening or, or potentially happening for, for some of these commercial airliners, which one of them is a, it's like a prototype that's like that clear plexiglass kind of just, you know, boxing you in essentially to your seat. So you have a, a plexiglass divider and it looks like they're in the, the process of trying to get certified for that. There's another, uh, this is like a middle seat. So it's essentially replacing the middle seat with a Mm. sort of winged um, divider section. Uh, It looks like upholstered and kind of tapers into the middle. It's got cup holders. So it's essentially replacing that middle seat and and looks aesthetically like really nice. And then there's also uh, just some sort of real simple kind of like almost like a sun visor in your car, but kind of folds sideways just to give you a little more space and you could potentially rest your head on that. Well, it sounds like they're adding parts into an airplane. And again, I go back, anytime you mount something permanently onto the airplane, you got to get it certified. And if it has anything to do where a person could, if it could come loose in a crash and hit somebody, or you could run into it uh, in a crash situation, there's all kinds of testing to make sure it's safe. We're going we're gonna to move on to our next segment here. Uh, learn from failure, you know, some of these engineering, um, mistakes over the years and granted the industry is extremely safe, but we're going to talk a little bit about United airlines flight 811. So this one is crazy. And and you and I both listened about this Mm -hmm. in, uh, that book that we referenced in a previous podcast, uh, the checklist manifesto. And so the, the cliff notes of this flight are that the cargo door, this is a 1989 United airlines flight. The cargo door uh, had a latch issue and came ajar just enough to be, you know, blown off by the pressures and aerodynamics of the plane, hit the uh, the fuselage, punched an 11 by 20 hole in it, immediately sucked out nine people. And then obviously the plane was in crisis mode from that point on, but but landed safely beyond that, which is pretty remarkable. 
Um, so Alan, you read through the report. Mm -hmm. uh, wh how did this happen? Well, the way that cargo doors were set up on that, on the 747 and a lot of airplanes, that they were not plug doors. And what I mean by a plug door, it's like a, a stopper, like at a sink, uh, so that it, uh, the pressure actually forces the door closed against the aircraft skin. Right. That's the way like emergency exits are designed today. And that's from, Airbus, from inside airplane. the plane, pushing it towards the outside. Correct? Out. Right. Yeah. Except on the new 737s, uh, which they have a little, they're hinged. So the older airplanes, like a DC-9 had a plug door uh, because anytime it landed, you could smell jet fuel. It sucked. Uh, but the the a lot of the doors are plug doors. So they, the the force, the pressure in the, in the cabin actually pushes the door closed and it has nowhere to go. It's doors trapped. On that 747, it was like a regular door on your on your house or your car, more like your car, where it's just hinged, and yet the door opens outward. So to think about pressurizing your car, you could put enough pressure in there where the 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 latch mechanism would fail and that door would pop open, which is kind of what happened. Except in this case, the investigators went after that accident. The door was lost. I mean, the door hit the ocean, right? So they yeah. didn't have the door. And they didn't have anybody who knew anything about it because the people who were closest to it were killed in that accident horribly. Uh, so the investigators had gone back and looked at other incidents that had happened and decided that, well, it was some sort of mechanical failure. Like the, he's got these little cams. Um, I don't want to describe a cam, but it's like they the call letter them, C. Yeah. They call them lock the, sectors. Yeah. And yeah. They're made of aluminum and a little bit too thin, they said was part of the yep. issue. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they thought maybe they're not taking the load or not fully engaged, which if the airplanes bounce around, they could become less engaged and the pressure on the air in the inside of the airplane cabinet could be forcing the door open. Uh, one of the victims families decided to keep investigating. They thought that answer was not correct and didn't make a lot of sense to them. So they they sort of self-funded uh, more research into it. And they eventually found that door in the ocean. I think it's yeah. like 14,000 feet down. It's some crazy number, right? Mm -hmm. uh, bringing up that door and realized it wasn't, a, it wasn't a mechanical failure. It was an electrical failure. The electrical system uh, opened the door, essentially in flight, uh, that there had a, a, some wires that shorted inside the fuselage that told the, commanded the little motors that opened the door to open the door in flight. Well, there's no really no way to know that, right? And the only reason that the the investigators kind of figured that out, they had a similar ha accident incident happen on the ground where they had a circuit breaker blow and the door tried to open on one of these airplanes. And they're like, wait a minute, maybe we need to go back and look at the wiring. And they realized the wiring, um, old wiring tends to lose insulation and become very vulnerable to arcing and sparking between wires and wires can touch because they're not necessarily as restricted in movement as we in theory would like them to be and wires touched and bingo. Uh, so, you know, that's a weird one, Dan, don't you think? Because, because the initial investigation was just so far off the final answer, they weren't really that close. Yeah, it was, it was strange. And it, it, for the family. So Lee Campbell was the, the New Zealander who was one of the nine and yeah, his parents, Kevin and Susan Campbell, they, they took it upon themselves to, to go deeper and i'm not sure that they exactly got the 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 mechanism right of, of failure the exact mechanism mm -hmm. it seemed yeah. like the recovery of the door was really what what, what finished it off but they yeah. definitely got i mean they got boeing to or, or not boeing but they got the the ntsb to to reopen the case and start investigating it again and then they somehow found that cargo door, which again is miraculous yeah fourteen thousand feet below the ocean like, like how it's some how crazy number yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, like we don't even know like how many planes or other things have been lost at sea that we don't even, still don't even know where they are, which is just crazy right. to think about. No and idea. We found that door. Right. <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But the but yeah. pilots had one hell of a flight too in that, right? Because the, the ox they're at they're at altitude, and when the cargo door let go, it ripped out the basically ripped out the oxygen system, so the pilots didn't have oxygen, and they're at altitude, so they're putting on masks and realize there's no oxygen. Which is a double emergency. Now you do Not only do you have a hole in the side of the airplane, but now you're at altitude, and you don't have any oxygen, and you don't have a long time before hypoxia sits in, and you will go unconscious, or at least forget what you're doing, and start making stupid decisions. And so you have to get the airplane down fast. Yeah. So, and that was why this book was referenced in uh, in the checklist manifesto because 
in this situation, they didn't know what was going on. Like they heard a thump, I think is, uh, well, that was, I think what <laughs> the door leaving, I suppose. Yeah. Sure. Um, but then the, 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 they thought it was a terrorist attack they thought it was like some sort of exp- like a bomb. They didn't know what sure. happened and they couldn't get, a, they couldn't get a hold of the crew. So the, uh, I guess not the, not the captain, but the, you know, one of the second in command in the, uh, the, the flight crew, he goes out to see what's, the, you know what what's happening and he sees a 10 by 20 hole in the plane like i mean what at that point it, just what a crazy situation they all found themselves in and so yeah they lost quickly numbers their number three and four engines uh because you know debris ejected from the plane was going mm-hmm. into them and unfortunately it sounds like uh, a couple people went into the engines and uh yeah so from there they they started to lose cabin uh, lost cabin pressure and had to quickly decide what to do, which they had eventually settled on, like, we need to get down to 8,000 feet, you know, as quickly as we can, as we safely can, so that we can do this without a pressurized cabin, yeah. which they successfully did. And, and everyone else uh, was on that plane when it landed, which is crazy. So, Well, it just tells you the level of training of the pilots. Even in that situation, they knew what they needed to go do, and they worked on that checklist to get the airplane back to some level of safety. That's well-trained pilots will do that. Right, they're they're prepared for most incidents. Not to to say you're necessarily prepared for the door to come off the airplane. That's not a normal uh, day of flight. But uh, the door opening is one of those checklist things that if the door does pop open, what do you want to do? You want to get the airplane down to around eight thousand feet so you don't blow it off the airplane. But at this point, it was already too late. Uh, but the same checklist applied essentially. Crazy. That's yeah. crazy. I mean, you can't imagine just like the gaping look from from the, the crews. As he comes out to see what the commotion's about and sees a 20 foot hole in the mm. airplane, like something you just never expect to see, and then make yeah. really good decisions from there on out is, uh, yeah, it's it's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, that's just, you just never expect. It's like going down, you know, you just wake up and you go down to your living room, there's like a tiger in your living room. Like, what? <laughs> Well, what's, what is happening right yeah. now? You know, like very you similar make good decisions, yeah. but um, where's my checklist? Tiger, yeah. <laughs> tiger well, in basement, right? Exactly. What is? <laughs> what do you do there? No one knows. But yeah, I mean, it's Get pretty the remarkable. Hell out of there. And just yeah. the well, I think the big takeaway for me uh, as a as a not aviation lifer is just how much there is to lose on every given part of the aircraft. Like how well engineered every single part has to be, because that lock which was complicated for sure. It was not mm-hmm. just like a simple, yeah. you know, outdoor out, outhouse latch. No, no. Uh, yeah, very complicated, but had a, you know, a confluence of factors leading to this entire plane almost crashing, which is crazy to think about how every part has to be engineered to such a, a high standard. That's, that's a difference, I think, in the last 20 odd years or so is just the level of rigor and safety that we put in airplanes. It's, it's remarkable how much time is spent on that. Well, and something like this, I mean, I, I need to see a photo of, I actually haven't seen a photo of like what this latch looked like, but the way they're describing it, I can't even in my mind make sense of what this latch looked like because mm-hmm. they're talking about the complex, you know, it, it rotates into place and it has cams and it has all these different mm-hmm. sectors in it and, you know how do you design that and then say okay this is gonna work 100 percent of the time like we can test that this these kind of things will never happen it just seems like like i said lots of engineering into even the little sort of Mm -hmm. afterthought kind of parts yeah it's it's a any any door is complicated and if you've been a (laughs) i've been around too many doors and know how fussy aircraft doors can be because there's so many latches and locking mechanisms and secondary fault features built into those doors so that they don't come open and that you know that they're securely attached and there's visual indicators you can look at to make sure that the door is engaged and all all the cams are locked in like they should be it's not it's not a simple mechanism it's not a doorknob yeah by any stretch of the imagination it's nothing like that at all uh it's more like a submarine hatch i mean it's it's that kind of complexity or uh, like in the if you ever looked at the apollo capsule hatches it's very similar to that where there's just redundancy and redundancy and redundancy yeah complicated thing all right so our last segment of the show we're going to talk about a little bit of new technology and uh today we've got a couple uh so alan there's a lot going on in the 
vertical takeoff and landing industry. Oh yeah, specifically with uh, obviously, I, I think the big development is is just electric vertical takeoff mm-hmm. and landing. So yep, we got a couple, and we're going to be doing a lot of different um, content on on some of these different aircraft because there's there's so many different ones competing for it. Just seems like. I don't know. What's your take? Are they just competing to be the first to market? Is that really just the prize yeah. right now? Yes. Oh, for God's sake, yes. hundred uh, percent. Okay. Easy answer. Oh, everyone. Wow. It's just no, yeah, get get to market. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like anything else, right? You got to be first to market with a product that makes some sense. Now, the the real thing watching from the outside in, and you know, it just you you watch all these different aircraft companies that are eventually eventually trying to get to the same sort of thing, and I I don't. I don't know if that ever makes sense. Like the, the, to think that there's always going to be this huge commercial market, like the average Joe like me is going to walk out to the driveway and go fly down to the local quickie mart. I, I, I don't, that, that, that ain't happening. I, in my opinion, in, in yeah. some parts of the country in the world. Yes. 100%. Yes. But for a large part of it, probably not. Right. Uh, Cause it's just not designed for it. Now I read, uh, was it this week where uh, the Lilium, uh, Eve VTOL aircraft company is worth a billion dollars, U.S. dollars. Like that seems impossible. But okay, say they got a billion dollars. If you can't build an airplane with a billion dollars, then it'll never get done. Uh, and some of these exercises are great, but at the end of the day, you still have to execute. And I'm I'm never confident looking at some of these companies to think that they're going to execute it. Now, L- Lillian may be able to do it. There's a couple others, Joby Air Aviation. Uh, yeah, and, Joby's uh, a big player. So and I think player. Joby's probably got to have a bigger valuation. I don't have that number in front of me, but Joby raised almost $600 million recently, a large yeah. chunk of from Toyota. So they're right. very well funded. Yeah. But you should be able to build an aircraft that size for a billion dollars. <laughs> Come on. That's, that's not – that's way – too much money to build an Alan, airplane of Alan, that it, size. Alan, it's 2020, okay? You don't have, <laughs> if you, I mean, I get where you're coming from, but what you do today is you race to a really high valuation, you raise a ton of venture capital, and then you lose right. $3, million a qu- $3 billion a quarter, and then right, you're yeah. great. You're, you know, you're everyone's favorite Uber or whatever. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole, you're right, you should 100% be able to build whatever it is you're trying to build for that amount of money. But I think, yeah, it's a car. It's a car that Elon yeah. Musk spend that money on a car. You know, he is on. actually building stuff with his money, which is, which I do appreciate because That's good. none of these aircraft companies have actually, I mean, they've, they've got some prototypes. Some of them haven't even flown. Some yeah. of them haven't even flown a full size prototype, nor have they flown with anybody inside of it, which is sort of the kicker for me. Like, all right, when we get to the point where we're putting a human in it, then, then we're, then we're getting close. We got to get somebody flying inside of these things, not just automate them and control them from the ground. Uh, that's not where it needs to go because you're never going to certify it that way. So what are you going to do? You got to get you got to get a real person in there, and you got to have the confidence to fly that person inside of it. I don't know if it's a confidence factor that is lacking right now, or a, or a um, they're not uh, sure that the engineering is quite right. But in either case. Somebody's got to get there first, and they need to get there pretty fast for as much money as being poured into these aircraft programs. And you got to know that's your only way out of this financial hole you're about to dig. And I mean, I mean, a hole, like a crater, like a, the, yeah. a moon has run into the earth kind of size hole. That's kind of hole you dig yourself when you're in these programs, you know? Well, it's funny I, you mentioned that because we were talking about uh, the job board on Joby Aviation's website. Yeah. Yep. And it's vast. There's like 50 positions that they're trying to fill. Open. Yeah. And they're probably all what? $200,000 jobs? I mean, high level engineering Could positions, be. you know? I don't know if they're that six, much, six, but six, six yeah. figure probably, or at least oh, close. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're six figure, yeah. Most yeah, of for them, sure. Probably, yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, think about the cash salary. burn. Yeah, it's a big cash burn. Think about the sure. cash burn, and it's the most expensive place on the planet. Silicon Valley is not cheap. So the cash burn starts to add up, and well, they can that's burn, what scares you. Or they can build these planes via Zoom, can't they? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, you I'll, know. It, that, was a, that, was a, that was a joke, but uh, I, I mean, obviously I, they it's going to have to happen. Design than ever, I'm sure, yeah. Well, you have to. Well, at some point, you got to build parts. you got to assemble parts. So you got to have somebody putting the part A to part B with some screws. But, 
engineering wise, <laughs> there are some there are some engineers that would gladly work on site for their own sanity. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of times you just need a, a CAD screen <laughs> and an internet connection, and you're totally fine. Where no one's bugging you for hours on end. That would be a dream for a lot of engineers. But um, you know, at some point you got to make got to make this thing. So yeah. Zoom won't help. Yeah, that's true. But <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And obviously, this other one uh, we'll touch on is the Israeli cormorant. So have you seen this thing? It's yeah. more like a sort of like yeah. a Blade Runner style. <laughs> yeah. Which I what's funny is. <laughs> And it again, is, it is, it totally is, yeah. Yeah, and my That's instincts thought, could yeah. be way off on this, but when I saw it, I was like, oh, that actually, A, it does look more like a flying car, whereas all these other mm. ones look like mini helicopters. They look like pretty white, futuristic, smaller helicopters, but this one mm. actually looks like a flying car because the it has two fans in it that are built into essentially where the hood and the trunk would be, and right. then the rest of the body is boxed in where it could actually like bump into stuff. Where if, if you ever really wanted something maybe actually on the street, this would be much safer. It would be like chopping off street poles. It'd you know be a little, uh, right. like I said, more of like a bumper car. Um, but what do you think of that design? It's 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 quirkier for sure. They they've tested it unmanned, and right. obviously a lot lighter than having you know four people in it, five people in it. But uh, their mm -hmm. plans are for twenty twenty eight. So coming to you in eight long years. Which is oh, kind of makes on. which kind of makes me laugh. That's like their yeah. That's their yeah, that's, that's what it says that's on their website. Too far out. That's really too far, far out. out. I mean, twenty twenty eight. Well, human beings will just be avatars. Like we'll, I'll just be. We'll be living on Mars. I'll be man. in a holo I'll be a hologram. So I don't even need that. <laughs> yeah. I'll lay in bed all day while my avatar, which is a hologram, just runs around the city. So I'll just teleport. Well, that when I looked at the aircraft, I don't know about you. Maybe I've been I'm jilted or, or jaded uh, after all these years of looking at airplanes, but. My first thought was, that's a military thing. It does, Come well, it on, does right? look very military. Yeah. And that was part of the, the design is that it could sneak pretty much anywhere almost into the wilderness and pick, yeah. somebody, and pick somebody up and bump into some trees and not, you know, all that sort of stuff. That was part of its well, work. And then you're picking anybody up, they're, <laughs> they're taking somebody out uh, it, because it would be perfect for like a, a SEAL, group of SEALs um, or army rangers or somebody to drop in unexpected in some part of the world and do some damage and get the heck out with before they even knew what happened that's mm -hmm. what it looked like to me uh, it also had the shape of something that was stealthy and again it's small enough that it'd be very hard to pick up on radar it is shaped like something stealthy which you know it's like the f-117 it's kind of got those angular shapes like hmm i wonder how rf bounces off that thing huh it's probably got a pretty low R of cross uh, cross section. Uh, okay, so if I fly close to, the, close to the ground, I'm pretty stealthy. I can probably put six guys in this thing, and I can be anywhere in 300 miles uh, within the hour. You know that that kind of thing uh, has a lot of uses. So I kind of wonder if the 2028 uh, expected delivery date was for the commercial civilian version of the thing. It, it is because actually it felt yeah. like it's for okay. The, it's for the yeah in New York City. Walk out of the pizza place, get onto this car, <laughs> and then go <laughs> like Blade Runner. Which I'm just yeah, uh, I'm laughing, okay. but it's I mean it's not unreasonable, I guess. I mean because no, it is. It is unreasonable. Let's get to that. Let's get that out right now. There is no way we're flying down fourth avenue or whatever or 52nd street in new york city and getting pizza in this thing you know why because you're going to run into a building and kill a bunch of people so no that is not happening it is not happening okay all right you heard it here first you're never getting uh, pizza in a flying no. car you know how you get pizza you call dominoes and they just drive <laughs> they just drive it over or they send it in the little tiny drone i'm okay with that all right well that'll do it for today's episode of struck if you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening, and please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection.
Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com. R-O.com. 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 R-O.